Welcome to our final keynote. It's been it's it's been a thrilling three days. I felt like there was chemistry. Um, I had wondered a bit how the tr tr traditional storytelling reiterations of training would work with the digital material, but they seem to combine just like they are in the real world. And I'm, that's very pleasing. I think the real effect of a conference like this is not the presentations on stage or in, in panels, but the strings of ideas that people's ha people have and the discussions they have and the context they have and the work that they do at home following. And um, I'm excited about what's to come. We'd love to hear from all of you. I know we'll be doing this again. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and for devoting your time and attention to it. Our, our final keynoter um, is Amy O'Leary, and Gretchen from Frontline is going to introduce her. But I have to say one thing, which is that when I heard about Amy and invited her, I had an image from my childhood of an old issue of uh, Popular Science magazine with the soldier of the future on it, wearing an uh, independent flying backpack and treads on his feet and carrying every sort of equipment for every sort of weather and circumstance. Gretchen? Thank you, Mark. Um, everyone could just give him a round of applause for such a wonderful weekend. So my name is Gretchen Gavitt. Um, I am a digital producer for the PBS series Frontline, um, and I'm also a contributing editor at longform.org. Um, I am what one might call nerdily excited about um, introducing today's keynote speaker. Amy O'Leary is an award-winning news editor and multimedia producer at the New York Times, who recently stepped into the role as a reporter with the Times How We Live team. And Amy is charged with something that is so important, I think, as a digital producer, but, but all too rare in our newsrooms, which is to start thinking about crafting an online narrative when the story itself is conceived. At the Times, Amy has won a, a Knight Patton Award for Innovation in Journalism, a Gerald Loeb Award, and has been nominated for several Emmys for projects that I hope she'll be showing you in a bit. Prior to working at the Times, Amy was a producer at This American Life and a freelance radio producer and attended my alma mater as well, the Salt Institute for Documentary Studies. Um, and with that, I'm thrilled to hand over the stage to Amy O'Leary. Thank you, Gretchen, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you, Mark, for uh, bringing us all here so we could, uh, we've been generously convened, I think, to connect and learn from each other. Um, I, it is such an honor to be here and talk to you all about something that I, I care about a lot and I think about a lot, but I don't often get a chance to articulate clearly, so I'm really excited to share with you some of the things that have been kicking around in my brain today. And um, I want to start, uh, first of all, just to say, if you haven't already silenced your cell phones, that's completely cool. Um, when it rings uh, or there's a beep, I just, just totally a reminder that we live in this hyper-distracted, like crazily connected world. And so I want you to pay attention to your brain chemistry when you hear this. Okay? Just think about what's going on in your brain. That's what we're talking about today. All right. So I want to start with three days ago. I had a different um, opening to this talk, and, uh, and I scrapped it. Um, because I have this kind of hard time waking up. I am a night person. I am not a morning person. And I'm a little lazy about Twitter, too. But in the mornings, I've figured out that if I look at Twitter when I first wake up, it kind of wakes me up almost like digital coffee. Might be a good thing, might be a bad thing, not sure, but it works. And so on Thursday morning, I'm uh, trying to wake up, and I saw this. And conveniently blurred for narrative tension. What it led me to think about this tweet and what was behind this tweet um, has, has changed my thinking in the last 96 hours about what I think about is possible in terms of narrative and storytelling, technology and words. And I love, I really, really love this. I love that we live in a world where amazing things are happening so close to this very moment that I'm talking to you that um, we can still be surprised this often. I love living in a world full of surprise. And 
So, th and, and that's really the theme I want to talk to you about today. Surprise will, will uh, come up often in this conversation. And I hope what you see, uh, when you see what this is, which I will reveal to you at the very end of the talk, <laughs> an hour from now, it will surprise you too. Um, so, while this made me ecstatic, and I, uh, I ran into my editor's office Thursday morning jumping up and down, and I showed it to him, um, I, there was another set of tweets that I saw this week that, that broke my heart a little bit. Um, one of our brilliant correspondents at the New York Times, uh, his name is Damien Cave, he's currently based out of Mexico City. I really admire him and his work, and he is a smart digital thinker. Uh, he wrote a brilliant memo for the Times on ways we could, when he was in Miami, on ways we could better cover a hurricane online, and he is just one of those journalists who is a seasoned traditional reporter who completely gets the web. And I saw this week on Twitter he was engaged in this interesting debate, and these are just a selection of some tweets from this debate. And um, I saw this dichotomy represent again and again, and not just his language, but others who were chiming in in the conversation. I think there's this lazy uh, duality that we talk about a lot, where you see things like web monkeys talked about. And in contrast to things like great reporting, in particular uh, the Homeric tradition of great reporting. I. Uh, I'm proud to, to be and have been a web monkey. I really am. And I don't think, and I really hope it doesn't in any way restrict my ability to be a great storyteller in the Homeric tradition. Um, so one thing, just to get this off the table and out of the way, I would like to say and, 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 um, and put forth to this crowd, is I don't think these two things need to be at odds at all. I think um, we... We don't need to be fighting about two sides of kind of traditional versus digital journalism. I think when we do that, we focus on this conflict rather than a much more interesting question, which to me is how can we use the techniques that are changing our information habits to further our most important work and our most honored traditions of journalism? Um, so with that end, uh, uh, first though, I, I have to confess something, something we have to talk about, and it's, Something that I want to tell you that I've been feeling, that I've been noticing in myself, that I'm not entirely comfortable with. Something is going on in my brain. And I, I noticed it most acutely. Um, yeah, thanks. I noticed it most acutely. You guys are tweeting me. It's great. Um, uh, <laughs> When, so I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with The Daily. This is the News Corporation iPad-only tablet newspaper. Um, when it launched uh, about a year ago, I had a couple friends go and work there, and I was pretty interested in what they were doing to experiment with this format. So I spent a couple weeks, and I really studied it. And, um, and I noticed I would usually read on the train, and I would start swiping and swiping. And I love they have this little gauge at the top that tells you how, how much of the issue you've gotten through. And it sort of feels like a game, like maybe I can get through the whole issue, right? And I would go a little faster and faster, and sometimes there would be an article, and I would just, my finger would just hover, like, uh, maybe I'll read it. No. <laughs> and even if it was something I was really interested in and wanted to read, I'd find myself hover and then no, and just keep doing it. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> be cool. All right, yes. Um, so the content is a little different here than my normal uh, information diet. And eventually, you know, I, I, after swiping for so long, I kind of stopped. And I stopped checking in with it. And um, then I stopped subscribing. And then I started, because I now had the iPad, reading the New York Times on the iPad on the train to the way, on the way into work. And I noticed I was doing the same thing. The content was pretty different, um, meant for different audiences, I think. But I find myself today swiping past articles I know are really great reads on the iPad when I'm on the train in the morning, and I wanted to know what is happening to me. <laughs> so I decided to, now that I'm a reporter and have been for 84 days, uh, to do a little reporting, and fortunately there are a lot of experts in the building that I work in, and one of them is Matt Richtel, who uh, is in the How We Live group with me at the New York Times. He's a reporter who focuses on technology. He won the Pulitzer Prize for identifying and defining the terms distracted driving, which has uh, led to an avalanche of laws around the country to prevent that dangerous habit that we've developed in our time. And he spent the better part of the last three years looking into questions of distraction in the brain. So I asked Matt, talked to him about this, and I asked him what was going on. The first thing to realize is that Part of the allure of all this technology is actually neurologic. It seems like one way to digest it is, well, we're getting information. We like new information. Who doesn't like new information? 
but beneath that, we are excited by it because when something new comes in, in a very simplistic way, it gives us a little adrenaline burst, a dopamine squirt, as it's described. A dopamine squirt. Now, dopamine is the chemical messenger in the brain that affects a number of things, including our emotional responses and our ability to experience pleasure. When you click on something and you see something new and unexpected, like, say this, you weren't expecting this, puppy photo. It excites the brain and it gives you a little reward, a little dopamine squirt of pleasure. Now, it makes sense to have pleasure when you click on something and see that it's truly rewarding, like an adorable puppy photo. But what about when you are clicking on something and, frankly, it's just kind of a bunch of crap? Um, I mean, you know, there's a lot of content out there on the web that's designed to make us click, right? And then, I mean, how many, how many, how many times do you remember a top 10 article, top 10 things you need to know about something you totally don't care about, right? And, and what do you retain from that? Now, some of us have started to wonder as we click on these things, maybe late in the night when we're supposed to be crafting our presentation for a keynote address at a conference, <laughs> why do we keep doing this? Why do we keep clicking on this stuff? I, I swear to God, I looked at Pinterest like six times and a slideshow of Kate Middleton's spring wear when I was doing this <laughs> presentation. Um, so again, uh, fortunate to work in a building with lots of experts, and one of them is Charles Duhigg, a reporter at the Times, who just wrote uh, this book, The Power of Habit, which is currently on the bestseller list, I think at number three. He's also the investigative reporter behind the New York Times' work on um, labor conditions in China and the human cost of the iPad. Um, and I asked Charles, who has studied habits and, and the neurology behind habit formation, why we keep doing this even when we know the stuff is crap. And um, I, I uh, was able to actually record him in the building. So. so what we've learned about habits, particularly the neurology of habit formation, is that every single habit has three parts. There's a cue, a routine, and a reward. Whoops. And a cue Sorry. is like a trigger for the automatic behavior. A routine is the behavior itself. A reward is why your brain, your neurology, encodes that b pattern for the... Sorry. Ah, I apologize. Technical malfunction. Um, can you guys hear him? Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry. We'll just do that one more time. So what we've learned about habits, particularly the neurology of habit formation, is that every single habit has three parts. There's a cue, a routine, and a reward. And a cue is like a trigger for the automatic behavior. A routine is the behavior itself. A reward is why your brain, your neurology, encodes that b pattern for the future. And when most people think about habits, they think about the behavior, just the routine. But the cue and the reward are much more important. They're the, they're the, the way that you unlock a habit. So to apply this as simply as possible to our work as journalists, um, you, can, you can substitute these words here with lots of different things in our lives. But uh, uh, the simplest way to maybe understand how a habit loop works in terms of online journalism would be to look at something like the headline as the cue, a click as the habit, and maybe a good read as the reward. Um, so I, there so are, I apologize. Um, so I also, though, asked Charles to tell us what cues trigger reading that he's come across in his work. So what we've learned about habits, right. particularly ah. the neurology of habit formation, is that every single habit has three parts. And he repeats There's himself because it's a habit. A routine, <laughs> and, a, and a cue is like. So I believe that the that there are really only two cues that signal to us or that trigger reading. Um, the first is the immediate proposition of value. Right, I'm delivering something to you that you need right away. And more than that, because I think that that's hard to do, is surprise. I think if you immediately signal narratively that you are going to have surprise within your piece, then your piece works. I think surprise is the only thing that genuinely matters in creating a narrative structure, is that you have to set up an expectation and then you have to violate that expectation with something even better. And once you do that, if you do that early in a piece, you signal to the reader, come along for the ride, because I promise you where it's going to end up is not where you think it's going to end up. It's going to be someplace more awesome. Someplace more awesome. Now, I want to talk about this a little more deeply. I want to talk specifically how we can signal surprise in our stories to deliver our readers and our viewers and the audience for our work into a place that is more awesome than they could have ever expected. And that begins uh, with something that I think is highly underrated, but very important, which are compelling cues. So um, cues are interesting. I think um, 
uh, there's a really great TED talk recently by Andrew Stanton at Pixar, who uh, was the creator behind Wally and Finding Nemo. And he said that at the beginning of a story, you are giving a promise to your viewers, and that a well told promise is like a slingshot being pulled back. And when I worked as a web editor for The Times, one of the things I was constantly looking at was how we promoted our stories. Um, and uh, from everything, from like uh, the headline on the homepage to what the promo image was, th this seems like, th again, th these seem like the kinds of things that we leave to the web monkeys, but they're actually vitally important. Um, the art of the promo is an underrated one. Now, the, one of, there are a couple of key things that I learned when I was an intern working for Ira Glass at This American Life, and th one of my favorite speeches that he gave me was on maybe the first week I worked there. And he sat me down and he said, kid, I'm going to give you your own radio show. And I'm going to give you your own radio show, and it's important you do well because people are going to decide whether or not to listen to my radio show based on your radio show. And he was giving me the intern responsibility of crafting the 30-second promo every week. And I think he put it into really great context because if no one, if you have a bad promo on the web, it's not just like people are, are on the radio. I mean, they, they do leave the radio on, but on the web, people have to choose you. They have to click into you. You have to give them something that's going to make them decide your story is worth their time. The promo is more important than ever, and it's not something that should be left to an afterthought or to someone who doesn't have a high stake in your story. So we don't think about this nearly itself. And like Charles says, when people are looking at our habits, they typically only look at the habit itself, the click, right? And if you're just focused on the click, you end up with all these mechanisms that are click-driven and not reward or surprise-driven, not story-driven, not narrative-driven. And so you end up with articles like this, which you know totally has a purpose. I completely Googled this, which is um, the... Uh, Huffington Post has a, an article that actually, if you Google what time is the Super Bowl, because you want to know what time the Super Bowl is, you will find an article explaining what time the Super Bowl is. Um, Huffington Post has been very good at, su at successfully gaming search engines like Google to have their content seen by lots of people. But again, if you're focused on the click and not the reward, just getting the click, you also end up with things like BuzzFeed, which is a site that looks to engineer content that will get the most traffic and sharing from social media networks. Again, uh, this, is, this is looking to get your click and not necessarily tell you a story. Um, now, the most uh, distressing thing about our, our brain habits in this the form is it almost doesn't matter what the content is. We get addicted to clicking anyway, because when we begin a habit, like this. Um, there, what happens in the brain is that if we typically are looking for the reward of the surprise, but after a while our brain starts to anticipate the surprise and gives us the little dopamine burst earlier before we've even actually done the thing that we're setting out, the, done the habit that's going to incur the reward. So we're getting the brain reward earlier and earlier. Now, I asked Matt Richtel a little bit about this, and, and he had, um, he talked to, uh, he calls this the lottery ticket syndrome. So. Researchers call it the lottery ticket syndrome. You know how you go to your email, and most, most of it is irrelevant. Mo uh, much of it is, is foolish, like a promise for, you know, you trade your Social Security number to a Namibian prince for a million dollars. And yet, People check all the time. Why? Because they're waiting for that one thing that might be good. It's one of the most powerful lures in psychology. It's called intermittent reinforcement. So on a, on a specific New York Times payoff level, we lose our audience if we don't meet their um, click with substance. But on the broader level, this is a very dispiriting thing to some researchers who would love to see us disconnect a little bit because they say it doesn't really matter if the stuff that is good or bad that you click on. And in some ways, it's more addictive if it's not good. So in some ways, it's more addictive if it's not good. Isn't that depressing? And that's, that's because you keep clicking then because you keep, you keep looking for that payoff, right? Now... Interestingly enough, uh, in terms of social media, that, that there, there's a weird shortcut that I've been talking with people about uh, anecdotally that seems to ring true. Um, it used to be that our narrative cues are pretty straightforward, right? We know once upon a time, you're going to get a story, guy walks into a bar, you're going to get a joke. And now we've got 
1,281 people like this. What are you going to get with that? What does that mean? What is that cueing to us narratively? Now, we see that um, a lot of people are interested in something, sort of like this. It's sort of like, you know something's happening there. You know that... Uh, you might wander up and look over. Um, and if you saw this in the real world, I would totally go and look. But um, I, I think... Something that's happening in terms of social media, I have these two great neighbors, these uh, young women, one of whom runs NYU's local blog for, for the university and the other, who, uh, the other of whom works at Tumblr. And we talk about like digital technology and journalism all the time. And they were up in my apartment. We were having a glass of wine and chatting about all these ideas. And, and my neighbor, Zoe, said, you know, liking something on Facebook is just a formality these days. Um, you click like and you move on without even realizing that you moved on, and you never really read it. Um, and, of course, there are people who read articles on social media, and, and, but I have noticed this in myself, too. I will quickly like something or retweet it or hurry to tweet something that I haven't fully read. And that, I think, is because there's something else going on. So you see a Facebook link. You click like. The reward is not to read it and have gained some knowledge. The reward is that you get some kind of social capital by telling, hey, your friend or this article that I like this too. I'm, I'm with you. I approve of you. And you can get that social capital without reading. So it, with all of these habit loops, we have to examine the cue and the reward. Again, not just the click, not just the habit. So because you can get away with clicking like, um, if we want someone to read to read our stories and not just like them. What do we do? What is the reward then? That brings me to the next thing I want to talk about, which are the real rewards of our work. Um, and this is where I really, this is where I think there's a grand synthesis that's yet to be, un, yet to be tapped that we haven't really figured out. Um, I think there are real, like, wonderful, emotional, tangible rewards in the best narrative journalism. And you know, as, as Andrew Stanton, the guy from Pixar, said, stories really work when they make you care. And this is part of our craft. We know how to make people care. And when there's an emotional payoff that, yields, that, that uh, really rewards you for making the investment in a piece, we do tend to share things and click on them and experience them if we know that that's what we're going to get. Um, this is the famous New York Times most emailed list. Uh, which is, uh, the, there's sort of a tyranny of it in our newsroom. It's kind of the only, we know a story is good if it gets on the front page of the newspaper, but this is the only real public way that people have a sense of what's being um, shared around on the New York Times website. It's, it's a really flawed metric, and we know all kinds of reasons why it's flawed. The people who, who uh, uh, when you email an article, that means you're using the email tool on the page, which means you're maybe not savvy with copying and pasting a link. And so a lot of people who share articles, they're, they're not counted in this. It's, it's a very specific self, sort of self-selected group. But last year, a group of researchers at the Wharton School um, in the Journal of Marketing studied the most emailed list at length, uh, trying to understand what makes online content go viral. They looked at a number of articles, and they ranked the articles in terms of a different range of emotional kind of rewards or payoffs or tones in the articles. And they found there was only one quality that would actively, like, get, like an article would not make it on the list if it had this quality. And, and articles that made you feel sadness would never get on the list. Um, however, they found eight emotions and things that would get articles on the list, now including anger, anxiety, anger, awe, positivity, emotionality, interest, surprise, and practical value. Now, this list is a little longer than what Charles said. He was saying practical value if you really need the information, and surprise, I would say awe, also kind of fits into surprise. Um, and, and it was funny, the researchers, while they, <laughs> they instructed the people coding their articles to look at the Wikipedia definition for surprise to figure out what that was, um, and they defined awe themselves, though. They said, awe, articles vary in how much they inspire awe. Awe is the emotion of self-transcendence, a feeling of admiration and elevation in the face of something greater than the self. It involves the opening or broadening of the mind and an experience of wow that makes you stop and think. Um, they use the examples of a Grand Canyon, or the Grand Canyon and a symphony, and I just feel like maybe one of the things we need to do is think more um, purposely about how we record the Grand Canyon and write a symphony. 
But maybe more importantly, we need to signal these things up front. So because our story's success will depend in large part if we can cue readers that it's worth their time, right? That something is awesome or funny or persuasive or surprising or jaw-dropping. Um, we have to really think about this part of our work. Um, I have this routine at the gym. I go and I run on a treadmill and I listen to my favorite nerdy radio show podcast called the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Um, then I go lift weights and then my mind starts to wander and I have to run again and I get a, a little bored and this is when I really need some stimulation. And I found, uh, I found this app and it, I mean, a, a, many of you are familiar with TED Talks, I would assume. And, but they have this fascinating little thing in their app where they know this. They're working on our cues and rewards exactly and precisely. This is the most concrete expression I could find of someone actually trying to play to these emotional cues and, and, and trigger us to get into content. In part of their app, they have this section called Get Inspired. And rather than say, okay, I mean, you can look at, at their content lots of different ways. You can find the newest thing or the most popular thing. But here you come to Get Inspired. And they give you a menu. So... Do you want to see something courageous, funny, persuasive, ingenious, jaw-dropping, beautiful, fascinating, informative, inspiring? Maybe we choose ingenious. Then it asks you, how much time do you have? <laughs> you can say five minutes up to 60 minutes. If, if you say a long time, it'll build a playlist of things that are inspiring for you. And once you've clicked through that, it gives you, a, it gives you your selection. 13 minutes of jaw-dropping talks right here. Um, and you know, it usually delivers. Usually there's something I've never seen before and I leave the gym feeling kind of amazed and transformed and I forgot about the pain of running for the last 20 minutes. Because what they deliver me on the back end is something I've never heard of before. And there is no greater surprise than an original idea. And I think if surprise is driving our behavior because we're scanning the horizon and we're constantly looking for the new, this is a really great thing for journalism. Because it means that when we go out into the world and we find surprising stories, that is where the real payoff lies. Now, um, I have very good news for you in the next section. Uh, I'm very excited about a quiet revolution that is taking place today among many outlets that have risen up to experiment with online information. Um, there seems to be this quiet consensus that original content may be the best strategy of all. Um, <laughs> Shocking, I know. Now, uh, the, the uh, intrepid Andrew Phelps over at Neiman Lab, someone I read regularly, recently put together a fascinating post on um, Gawker and the, the Gawker media empire and how they've recently changed strategies. Um, now, Gawker, uh, uh, so, so this, is, this is from an internal memo at Gawker where they have written, now a different staff writer will be forced to break their usual routine and offer up posts they feel would garner the most traffic while that writer struggles to find dancing cat videos and Burger King bathroom fights and any other posts they feel will add those precious, precious new eyeballs, the rest of the staff will spend time on more substantive stories they may have neglected due to the rigors of scouring the internet each day to hit some imaginary quota. That's an internal memo from Gawker. Now, so they run this experiment, and Andrew Phelps uh, went with them and measured what happened, where they basically, so they've got this one writer out chasing traffic, chasing eyeballs, any kind of cheap post that can maybe get some links, <laughs> like I can't stop looking at this weird Chinese goat, right? And then everybody else was working on original content. Now, there were more of these posts, because these take a lot less time to produce. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, this is now... They've, A.J. Delora, the, one of the editors there, described it as the new Gawker, the Gawker that now values original content more than over-aggregated gutter journalism, as Delario calls it, uh, snappy, snarky, snarking, snark, snark, shit. <laughs> so this is a very interesting moment in, in, in time. And if you look at the numbers from, from what they discovered, the stuff that was clickbait, the funny goats, um, the, uh, now there were more of these posts, so overall they got more traffic. But if you looked at, uh, on average, um, they got, you know, 54,000, about 55,000 posts, whereas the original content got about 60,000 posts. It's a marginal difference. It's not huge. But it, you would expect that the crazy goat photos would do much better. And in fact, they don't, because people are looking for something that's new. Um, in a similar, I have now made fun of BuzzFeed twice. And uh, in a similar move, BuzzFeed kind of shocked 
uh, you know, the site which is designed to get you to click from things from social media has now hired Ben Smith from Politico and Dory Shafir from Rolling Stone, and their mission is now to have scoops, original reporting. Um, a piece in the Times said, BuzzFeed, a site where the editors and algorithms sift the web in search of viral articles elsewhere, has decided it needs articles of its own. The reporters will be scoop generators, Mr. Preddy said. Most interestingly, at Salon, um, Carrie Lowerman, the editor-in-chief, uh, recently wrote a fascinating memo, and um, you'll be able to find links to all this stuff in my Twitter feed. Um, but he, he started off by saying, I'm here to tell all of you that there's no trick, no gimmick to draw people to read from your website. Trust me, we've tried. He continues to say that a few years ago at Salon, like all publications, we tried to write our ship as we tried to write our ship in deeply troubled recessionary waters, we followed the familiar script of other sites. We laid off terrific staffers to lower our costs. We brutally pared down our expenses. We revamped staff priorities so that writers could simply produce more. We experimented in a fair amount of low-calorie aggregation, and yes, there's that word, aggregation, the most inflammatory in our industry. So let me, come, let me explain exactly what I mean by it. Short, a few hundred word summaries or explainers about a major news event covered in more depth by somebody else. In its best form, we wrote short little decoders of a big story and tried to link generously to the original source. At its worst, we monitored Twitter and Google for trending topics and dispatched an intern to cobble together our own summary, posted it quickly, and prayed to the Google gods the effort would win, if only briefly, their favor. Now, he continues to say he was not proud of that approach. Um, and that, uh, this is another section worth quoting, he said, but a terrible per pernicious thing has happened to journalists in the past decade that's had us second guess everything we know. Sometimes it's led to brilliant new reinventions of the forum, other times it's just led to self-doubt, something I see in a sea of job applications from fine mid-career journalists every time we post a new position. We've been trained to rethink everything, even if it leads to producing useless information at the behest of people whose only contribution to the marketplace has been to sneer at it, shrink it, and dumb it down. But, then they changed strategy, and he said a funny, delightful thing came out of it. Um, they started doing less, and they started getting more. It was 33 fewer posts, original content, not aggregation, and they got 40% 40 40 greater traffic. Um, and here he says it sounds simple and obvious, but we've gone back to our primary mission of been focusing on originality, and it's working. I hope that's good news. Um, I think a lot about uh, what distracts us, and so even on an original story, what distracts us from them, and originality is very important. And when you have an original story, how can we best use what's happening in the digital universe to make sure that story sings and finds its audience and is well read all the way through to the end? I have a few ideas. Um, they're not... Uh, I'm not an expert in this, and I, I think that actually the most exciting thing about this is that w nobody has nailed this yet. Um, the, the field is wide open to figure out how to integrate everything that's happening with technology and our attention span and the brain with really great storytelling. That one example at the end, I think, will uh, is maybe a glimmer of hope. But the ideas I've jotted down so far in my notebooks include, number one, to close the exits. All too often, I see really great stories with over, overladen with bells and whistles and multimedia gadgets that serve to do very little but to distract you from the actual story. I can't tell you when I was a web editor at the Times how many times a, a producer would create a timeline that served no vital function to the story at all, but just because we had points of information that we could place in a chronology. Um, and I see far too much work online. Just because you can add it doesn't mean you should. And I think we create all these, these exits for our readers. I think if we use stronger editorial judgment and think very much about our narrative path and close those exits and show people the really, the, the gems, the best stuff in a line, in a story, um, we can be much more effective. One example I'd like to show, uh, this, was, this is sort of a, an experiment at the Times, but uh, Amy Harmon, a really great long form writer at the Times, did a beautiful series on autism in the last year, adults with autism, coming of age. and. Um, one of the people she wrote about was Justin Kana, uh, an, illustra uh, an aspiring illustrator who draws like perfect Disney characters, but right now is working in a bakery decorating cookies. 
And she wrote a beautiful, very long story for, for the paper. And one of the things we experimented with, rather than having all the multimedia kind of off to the side and these extra bits where you might see what he's like in a video, it was placed directly in the text, and it did not take you away from the story. This seems simple, this seems obvious, but not taking your reader away from your story is, is kind of a, 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 a basic but really important thing we need, to, we need to think about. So you'll get a sense for how the article worked here. So we're still on the page. I have a book of biog. I have a book about myself, about me. Is it a picture of me? Picture of me when I was a baby. I feel a little bit emotional, like happy, and, and the tears are bursting. I start a little bit crying because birth is a first day of everything. Look, see, this is me when I was a baby. Isn't this adorable? I was born on August 12th, 1989. So that's just a little snippet, just a little nugget. It's not a fully produced documentary. Um, but it allows you to, and in this very long article, to experience pieces of Justin's story that are maybe more effective in video than might have been in print, but that don't take you away from Amy's beautiful writing and her beautifully crafted story. The other thing that I think we have to be ruthless and relentless about, and something I feel very strongly about, is we can't have any slack in the narrative. Um, I think any time, and, and I talked to Matt Richtel about this, uh, he he said that anytime we give people, you know, a moment of boredom, a, a moment where they might, their attention might wander, their email is right there, you know? That Nigerian prince is right there, and it's really alluring. And if we, cr if we have space in our stories, we're not fully engaging people with the story we're telling, and things just drift for a little bit, um, that's, that's a danger. Um, one of the things, I, I mentioned this in a session two days ago, or yesterday. Um, one of the things I really liked about the editing process when I worked at This American Life is most of the stories uh, at some point in the editing we would all come into one office and we would play the tape and you would hear the script and we would all mark and take notes for when we got bored. Um, and that served as sort of this mini focus group or panel and we would excise those parts. If, if everybody was kind of bored at a part that's a pretty good note that we would edit it there. Um, it was, it was a way to sort of tease out the moments where the narrative got a little slack and make sure it was tight as possible. I know a lot of people have been thinking about um, uh, this, American's life, this American Life's techniques and, and especially um, the challenges they had with Mike Daisy's piece recently, but uh, something I saw that I thought um, I, I really agreed with, uh, there was a tweet about this, um, and I don't usually agree with Jay Rosen about a lot of things, but he wrote, it's not just that Mike Daisy lied, it's that journalists who do the hard work should also learn to do great theater. I thought that was very smart. Um, because I think there are, if we can you know, uphold our standards for truth and accuracy, and we can use the devices of you know, great narrative and drama to keep people engaged with our readers, then we've sort of won for the day. Um, the third thing, and this is hard to do, uh, but man, so we, we need to be, oops, sorry, surprising always as much as we can. I think in a world where people are constantly scanning for the new, um, you know, even if it's, if it's having a twist in your story or saving the point till the end, um, keeping things off stage and making sure we are good managers of our readers' attention by unfurling a string of surprise for them in our stories is, is one of the most important things we can do. Um, I think it works on all, that, all the brain chemistry of, of rewarding people with the new. Now, sometimes that means, uh, one, of, one of the interesting strategies that I've learned is that means we surprise people almost uh, to the point of disorient, disorienting them a little bit. Um, and uh, I, I uh, serve on the advisory board for Virginia Quarterly Review, and they do some really wonderful work online. And their editor, uh, Ted Genoways, wrote me when this, this new piece came out recently and asked me for my, he said, I, we would love your feedback, Amy, beyond telling us that no one watches 16 minutes in uh, video on the web, which I've definitely said before. Um, but this piece blew me away. Um, it, I, I was riveted to the whole thing on the web, and I, my attention wanders quick. 
Um, it's by Maisie Crow. She is one of my personal heroes. I could play just about anything by her because it's always so surprising how she starts. She's got no formula. It's not like anything else. And, um, and it, 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 she just breaks all the rules because she's surprising you with her choices all the time. Um, so I'm going to play just a minute and a, or a little over a minute of uh, this piece, which is called Half Lives, The Chernobyl Workers Now. Um, this piece also just won second prize this month in the World Press Photo Contest for Multimedia, and it's absolutely worth checking out. Потому что энергия нужна. Энергия – это жизнь. Получать надо, отдавать что-то. Что такое дежурные инженеры электростанции до последнего времени? Я все время занимал этим. А сейчас уже я отработанный материал, я никому уже не нужен. Зачем так ты говоришь? Ну а что? Что я буду? Витя, тише, успокойся. Да, господи. Я уже свое отработал. Низкое давление. Так, и где Сергеевич? Сейчас на тебя подлечит. Давай. Упал на пару подлечит. Что сделаешь? Такая жизнь наша. Her work is always really affecting, but I, I could never predict or tell you what her method is to begin, begin a piece. Um, it's always different, and it always works, and she's always surprising me, which is why I watch 16-minute videos that I would normally um, not. Um, but I also think her work, and, and all the very best work, allows something, and this is the, the last thing I've been kicking around with and, and really trying to learn how to do this in print now, but it's, it's leaving room for your reader or viewer. Um, Andrew Stanton, in his TED Talk, which I really like and, and recommend, uh, calls this 2 plus 2 equals 4, that you, how's your, how are your brains doing with that? That's not me. It's not a test. <laughs> it's cool. Um, he basically says that, you know, it, rather than saying the story is 4, you tell them the story is 2 plus 2. And if you think a lot about a lot of the great sort of addictive television that we're in this sort of golden age of, like The Wire, you know, The Wire doesn't explain everything to you. You have to do some work to figure it out. And I think, um, I think we don't do enough of this, especially journalism. You know, we have this habit of, of um, trying to be very explicit up front. And, and one thing I often uh, talk about, I think I'm on a personal crusade to destroy the inverted pyramid. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, I think, you know, I mean, first of all, a pyramid, just side, a pyramid represents death, right? That's a tomb. What, you, you flip death upside down. You know, that's, I don't even know. It's just depressing. And the inverted pyramid basically sa tells people that, that I've told you everything important up front, and with each word you read, this story is getting less and less important. <laughs> with each word you read, you can care less or walk away anytime. I don't care. The detail at the bottom isn't very good. <laughs> And maybe, maybe, sure, that's what the kicker is for. There might be a little joke at the end. If you, that's your reward, your treat. But I really, like, I mean, and, and Matt Richtel and, and Charles and I, we've all talked about this because in, in our biggest stories, you know, even on the front page of the New York Times, 
you know, we're now having conversations about things like characters. Um, you know, Charles's beautiful story about the iPad, there are characters in the beginning of that story that you don't know if they're going to live or die until he gets much further in the piece. That is not, um, that's not traditionally how front page journalism, I think, has been done. But with all that, uh, we leave room for the reader to think, imagine, engage, and explore our work. Um, we let them figure some things out as they go along. We understand that they're not going to they don't need to know everything right up front. They can be dropped into a disorienting place with a bunch of people, and they'll stick around to figure it out because that's how the world works. We're dropped into the world, and we have to stick around and figure it out. Um, there's a really lovely example uh, of this work by a guy named Jonathan Harris. This is Jonathan Harris. He is the creator of Cowbird, which is an interesting multimedia platform um, that primarily has stories uh, that are, are a, usually a single photo, sometimes audio, and usually short text. Um, I encourage you to check out the site. Um, and he's got a lot of interesting ideas about uh, the way that viewers come to work. But I wanted to play you a very short excerpt of one of his projects on Cowbird. Um, been Whoops. Uh, so this is a, a story about a former teacher of his who had been a playwright for a time. And uh, at the end of this teacher's life, uh, Jonathan went and interviewed him several times. And uh, he talked a little bit about his struggles with trying to write a good story in a play. He had been writing all these plays. He was a young playwright, and he was writing all these plays, and he was trying to take on these big themes, these big ideas, and try to say, say big, important things about these ideas. But then the plays would come out, and the final thing would always be like 20% of uh, the vision that he had had for it, and he'd always feel very disappointed in it. And um, he realized something, which he told me then. He said, I realized I was trying to make the audience go, wow. And he raised his hands and leaned back as he said that, wow. But what I actually needed to do, he said, was to make the audience go, wow. And he leaned closer into me as he said the second wow. And I said, whoa, like, can, you, can you explain that again? What was that? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll show you again. And he said, so it's this difference between the wow, where you lean back, and the wow, where you come forward. And he said, you know, what he was trying to do is he was trying to impress people, and he was trying to stun them with all of his knowledge and all of his virtuosity. But actually what he had to do was admit his own weaknesses and his own uncertainties and invite the audience up onto the stage with him to participate in the answering of the questions that he himself didn't really have answers to. And he said this is something you see a lot with like Hollywood movies with special effects where they try to stun you and amaze you and you kind of lean back in your seat and go, wow. But then, you know, you kind of forget these things with time. It's like a sugar high that passes. But the things that really haunt you and stick with you are the things that invite you to come closer, the things that leave something out, the things that leave something left for you as the viewer to fill in. My, uh, one of my editors, my former editor at the Times, Andrew Davigal, talked to Jonathan a little bit about his work, and um, Jonathan told him that he says he's always found there to be a certain obscenity to video because it leaves nothing out. Um, and with video as a viewer, you don't get the chance to explore. It's like going on a ride instead of a journey, like being in am an amusement park instead of a forest. As viewers of video, we have no free will, but we subconsciously revolt at this lack of free will, and so what do we do? We move around the sidebar and skip to the end. Um, it's an interesting point of view. I, I struggle between wanting to give people that, I, I think we have to find a way to give people that space and that free will for them to find themselves in our stories, but we also have to be careful about the amount of exits we give them from our piece. Um, and I, I think, again, those questions come back to, to the narrative structure and to what we're doing with the stories themselves. So. At this point, um, I would like to show you the tweet that changed my thinking. Um, this was uh, from Dania Henninger, who I do not know, and it was actually retweeted, I think, to me. I, don't, I was not even following this person. Um, but Robin Sloan is a really interesting thinker and uh, writer. He's, I think, currently working on novels, but has done a lot of really smart blogging at a blog called Snark Market. 
um, he, he, he wrote one of my favorite uh, posts about the way we work now. It's, it's a, a post called uh, Work in Public and Reveal Nothing, which I think is a very interesting concept. But he made this thing um, recently, and he released it this week, and a lot of people uh, in sort of you know, digital thinking, storytelling circles have been interested in it. And it's, it's, uh, you can find it at his website, robinson.com slash fish. It's a free iPad, iPhone, app. it's an iPhone application, but it works on, on other iDevices. Um, and it really, I, I took this app, I downloaded it on my phone, I started going through it, I was amazed. I've taken it now and just set it in front of a couple people. Um, a colleague of mine at work, a reporter who's not very digitally oriented, I, I just came over to her on Thursday morning and I, I didn't even say a word, I just put it down on her desk. She looked at, at me and she looked at it and she looked and she started tapping and she bent over and she was tapping for a good, uh, I don't know, good 10 minutes or something. The, the, the essay in this project is about a thousand words. And she, when she was done, she stood up and she said, you blew my mind, I want to break the window and fly outside and do everything differently. Um, and so here's a little part. I'm going to show you just a little bit of the beginning and really encourage you to find this app and explore it for yourself. Um, but it starts like this. This is a tap essay. Just tap anywhere. Go for it. Tap. Tap. I want to talk about the difference between liking something on the internet and loving something on the internet. But first, a few things you should know about this app. Interesting structural things. Let's take notes. One, there is no back button. Two, there's a very light progress bar up above, and if you exit the app, I'll save your spot. Three, when you see a little Twitter logo down below, it means you've come to a tweetable line, and you can tap it to tweet. Very simple. A simple way to leave the app and share without actually leaving the app, right? Very nice. Very smart. You can be excited about this and still not have to leave to share it with your friends. Okay, onward. I have become very troubled by the way I am reading and watching things. Because there's so much to read and watch and so much of it is good. I mean, I just think of the links that flow through Facebook and Twitter. The Atlantic has 10 great things every day. New York Review of Books, holy shit. <laughs> Maria Popova's Brain Pickings, Kotki. The New Inquiry, have you, have you guys seen this? It's almost cruel, more smart, cool stuff. Smart writing, cool video, an endless flood. So what do we do to stay afloat? We like, we fave. And it's this gesture that is the heart of my trouble, the like, the fave. You're saying to a writer or website, this is smart and or cool. You're saying to your friends or followers, this is worth your time. This is worth your time. But me, I'm on to the next thing. <laughs> this is actually a very strange gesture. We rarely return to the things we like and fave, not even when we also click read later. We like everything. But I'm growing suspicious that our likes don't mean much at all in the endless flood, and so I find myself wondering, what does it mean to love something on the internet today? I leave you there. That's just the beginning. Um, he has some good answers to the question. Um, and again, I would uh, encourage you to check it out. But. The last thought I want to leave you with about this is I think this app showed me a hopeful way forward that you can create a little thing that plays on all of our addictive, clicking, brain chemical uh, impulses to want to see what's next, almost like a video game. And you can read a beautifully crafted thousand word essay that's going to change the way you think about your life. Thank you. I think we have time for a few questions. Um, I think there are microphones going around, so if you'd like to ask a question, uh, just raise your hand and someone will be down with, with the mic. Yeah? Uh, we're talking about feeding into brain chemistry for surprise. Um, I definitely support the idea of surprise and narrative. I think it's terrific. Obviously, I'm a writer. But are there any downsides we should be talking about in terms of 
should I say, such a grandiose thing as human development when it comes to uh, playing into, touching, slash pandering such a base human instinct as pleasure slash surprise? Um, it's a great question. Uh, I am not trying to make a judgment call on whether or not all this technology is good for us. I, I don't feel qualified to do that. I just know that we're swimming in it. And I would rather learn how to use it to my story's advantage than fight it, I guess. Um, I don't know if it's pandering. Um, I think that you know the oxygen for any story is, is if people see it and read it. And I would like to think that, um, again, if, it, if it's a promotion strategy or just a way to share your content or a way to get people to read your words, the words are the words. You can make them cheap if you want, but that's not what I'm suggesting. I think you, it's, it's better to you know, write your heart out, write the piece you want to write, and then figure out how to, how to invite people into it in a way that's compelling when you're competing against you know, the entire internet. Um, is there? So much of what we have to report on in a democracy is demoralizingly the same mm. over and over politically, business corruption and so forth. How do we leverage that idea of surprise and still do our civic duty? I mean, you're, you're talking about how do you take a, a constant theme and make it fresh? Exactly. I don't think that's a new question for journalism at all. Um, I think that's just great craft. Is there? Yeah, in the back. Um, it, two, two questions. You mentioned the surprise, and the first two questions were about it. Were about it. But um, so now I'm surprised to hear how important it is. And for example, the first day when we were here and we saw the Spitzer uh, movie, half of the audience didn't like the surprise of the. Uh, did you see it? I didn't. I okay. actually wasn't able so, to. So well, um, he had uh, this character that was played by an actress. Mm -hmm. He didn't say it at the beginning. Right. A little bit after he revealed that. He was an actress. And then he asked uh, the audience, and half of the audience didn't like that surprise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I don't know what's your take on that. And then, um, w like, what do you think about it? And um, the second one, what do you think about the Coney video? About the what? The Coney video. Oh, the, the Coney, Coney video. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, so sometimes people don't like surprises. That's true. Um, you know, but I, I don't think... Uh, I mean, I, I think there's, there's, a, 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 there's a bond, a, a bond of trust between a storyteller or a journalist and their audience. And I think if you violate that trust in a surprising way, that is not um, going to endear your readers to you. I, and I don't I didn't see the film. I'm not saying that that's what happened with that film. But if, if you are mucking with people's expectations about like how, how the work was made or what it is, that's a different kind of surprise than revealing a surprising fact you've never heard of because you found it by, through deep reporting. Um, so I think those are two different kinds of uh, surprises. As, as to the Coney video, I think it showed that um, there are all kinds of production values and techniques that are cues that signal this is going to be something emotional, this is going to be something compelling. I think it, it masterfully used those techniques. Now you could argue that, I mean again, polemicists and, and you know, people making arguments tend to use those techniques more readily than journalists um, because they can skew, right? So you have to be careful about which techniques you deploy, but again, I think r rather than running from them, we should you know, embrace them judiciously as they, as they serve our work. Yeah, I was wondering if sometimes uh, a website or any kind of thing that we do can be a little too clever for its own good. Um, I'm thinking in particular of uh, an author's website, uh, an author whose work I really like. Her name is Dana Goodyear, and you go, you click on www.danagoodyear.com, and all you see is her name in white space. And, and you click on it, and you play with it, and then you notice, well, if, if you drag and drop, a little line comes up. If you click on her name, then up comes... Uh, about, and you click again, and then up comes poems. And then you click on it again, and it's like, okay, Dana Goodyear is the poetry editor of the, of the New Yorker, and here are some of her clips, and here are some of her features and her stories and her travels. But mm -hmm. you have to do all this work to find it. I think it's, it's minimalist to the extreme. It's, you can't help but look at it. Right. But is it too much? Uh, I, I mean, without getting into discussion of usability and design on the web, um, I think 
again, you're probably coming to an author's website like that because you want what the first thing Charles talked about, which is you're looking for information and not surprise, right? And I think w what you're describing is she, she built a website that was engineered to surprise you. You're not going to know what you're going to get. Maybe you'll get one thing or the other. But actually, the, what the reader requires right then is information. Um, I think that's important uh, uh, not to lose sight of. There's certainly a lot of news and information that should be presented as quickly and cleanly as possible. I mean, when we were covering Hurricane Irene last year and, and how it was affecting New York City, we, you know, you don't have a lot of surprising, you know, unfolding features in a yarn. You tell people, like, they don't need to take their air conditioning out of their window and you just make that really easy to find in search you know oh, oh sorry can you wait, get the microphone they'll run down uh, thinking more about the exit problem uh, or issue I'm wondering if you've thought about ways because a lot of people like the additional resources and whether you can kind of throw them sort of like an index at the end of a book that you would only go to it doesn't keep you from reading very often, and except for once in a while. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, as a design, because you don't want to not have any of those resources, but you don't want them to get in the way. Yeah, this is a great question. We often struggle with having a wealth of background material, right? I have, there was one case where um, we had some documents for a story about, I believe it was about um, incidents at, uh, who it was like elder care facilities, and we had that like over a thousand pages of documents for this story, and gave it to a producer. And the producer, rather, and what I was expecting this producer to do was to cull through them and find maybe 50 of the most interesting anecdotes, highlight them, annotate them, put them into a document viewer, and link to them from the story. The reporter and producer in that case thought, well, everyone's going to want the full thousand pages, of course, right? And so they, they scanned in all thousand pages and crashed our document server. Um, <laughs> And no, I can guarantee you no one looked at all 1,000 pages. I, I, there are two kinds of, of ways to deal with supporting information. One is to make sure that uh, as you study your story, what are the things that actually are really interesting? And two, there's kind of a, and Charles Duhigg does this very well in most of his pieces. There's usually an entire second section on his series about toxic waters, and uh, uh, and same with the iPad, same with his book, where he, he lists everything exhaustively in an academic fashion for those who really want to check it out or check his work. Um, but again, that's pulled away from the narrative and storytelling. That's at the end in a separate section for those who want it. It doesn't interrupt the vast majority of readers who are not going to click every link. You have to be judicious. Other questions? Yeah. Hi. I, I wanted to go back to the, um, to the comment you made about the most emailed and, <laughs> and putting aside the the, what's problematic about using that as an index. Yep. Um, what about getting stories out there that are about human suffering and you don't necessarily just want to you know, lead or end with the bright side? So do you have any suggestions on for folks who are particularly doing a kind of advocacy work um, and writing about that in long form, what I to think, do with that? I think you can, I mean, there are other things on that list. Um, anger was on that list. Anxiety was on that list. Um, uh, I think there are other ways that people engage with, with difficult stories than sadness, perhaps. Um, and, and again, I think you can be surprising without being like a circus parade. You know, you can be surprising in difficult details, um, which is, is, that's why I keep going back to surprise as the key facet, because I think that really great reporting yields surprising detail, and any story can be made more compelling by surprising reported detail, and that just speaks to the very core of our work. Well, thank you all so much for the opportunity to speak to you, and have a great weekend. That was wonderful. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, see you next year. Travel safely. And this is for you.